My name is Karen Thomas, and I'm going to share with you about my near-death experience. I injured my back, and I had a ruptured disc that was keeping me from being able to work and had had a ruptured disc five years earlier than that. So I was really concerned about whether I might have to have a, a spinal fusion because the doctors had decided that I did need to have surgery. So it was unclear which surgery I was going to be having. And so I had been asking friends and family to pray for me because uh, I really was hoping I'd be able to keep my career as a physical therapist. And the day of the surgery, my husband and my two children went to the hospital with me. Uh, my surgery was scheduled to be one of the first of, of the day. And so they were there and walked beside my stretcher as I was taken down to the operating room suite. Um, and then they were, just before I went in, they were sent off to a waiting room. And my stretcher was brought in past lots of different operating rooms. And then they went into the one that I was going to be operated in. Um, this hospital that I was being operated at is the same one that I worked at as a physical therapist. And so I, I was very familiar with the hospital. Um, I had to go over to move over onto the operating room table and lie face down so that they could reopen the incision on my back. And they did that. I was put under anesthesia. And in some point during the surgery, I suddenly was no longer unconscious, but I was conscious. And I found myself, my consciousness, literally up in a corner of the operating room near the ceiling. And as I was up there, I began to hear the surgeon swearing and yelling at nurses to go and get blood transfusion. And, and it drew my attention away from the ceiling area back behind me, just in time to see them flipping my body from being face down to being face up and realizing that this in fact was my body that I was looking at from a totally different location. And as this was all happening, I was feeling a sense of calm and detachment uh, from my body, almost as though that was not even me, although I realized it was. And the only thing that I felt uncomfortable and not you know, calm and detached about was I thought of my husband and my daughter and son who were in a waiting room. And I thought if, if my consciousness is lo no longer in that body, then I must have died. And I somehow I have to get to them to let them know that I was all right, that I was somehow I'm still me, I'm okay. So as I thought that, my consciousness literally drifted through the wall of this operating room and out into the hallway I had come down, past all of these other operating rooms. And through the entryway into the operating suite, out into another hallway. And as my consciousness this was moving, I began to, to hear a telepathic voice saying, pay attention to this man. And it drew my attention to my left, where I could see a man in, in regular street clothes, and he was you know, rushing fast back toward the way that I had just come. And as as I was told to pay attention to him, I also was able to zoom in really close and see exactly what he was wearing, the, the colors of clothing he was wearing, the color of his eyes, his hair color. It, and I'm a very nearsighted person. So for me to be able to, to see that closely um, was just amazing to me. And at the same time, I began to hear his thoughts. 
And he was thinking that he needed to get into that operating suite quickly. And he kept rushing past and in that direction. So I, I turned my attention toward him in time to see another man um, just in regular clothes who was down near that area and hear his thoughts as he was thinking, that guy can't go in there. He's just a, a regular guy and, and he can't go in where they're doing operations. And so I heard both of these thoughts and then the man I was supposed to pay attention to to begin with paused for a moment and then double doors opened up and he rushed inside and then closed behind him. And so my thoughts returned to finding that the waiting room and finding my husband and my daughter and son. But before I could keep going in the direction that I was headed, I began to be pulled and no longer directing my own movement. And I was literally pulled up through the, the ceiling of the floor I was on and up through the next floor and up through all the way out through the roof of the hospital, way up into the sky above the hospital. And then I began being pulled rapidly, horizontally, in the direction of the city of Anchorage, which was near where this hospital was located. And as I got over the city, which sits on a bay, as I got to where I would be going over the water, a big dark opening um, that looked like either a cave or a tunnel or something dark and rounded opened up and I was pulled inside it. And as I was pulled inside it, I began moving extremely fast. And it was very dark, but very far in the distance, I could see a pinprick of light. And as I was pulled faster and faster, the light seemed to be getting larger and larger as I was getting closer to it. And then in what seemed like no time at all, suddenly I completely burst into this entire light that was enveloping the end of this, this tunnel area that I had gone through. And when I burst into this light, I, I felt immediately filled with just tremendous love and peace and, and joy and just amazing emotions that like you couldn't, could never imagine. And I, I, the light was everywhere and I began to think, well, where am I? And so I, I turned my attention downward to see what was this place that I was, had arrived in. And I, I realized I didn't have any feet where I looked and there should be feet, there were none, but there was a very brown and rocky sort of a ground, very desert-like, arid type place. And that puzzled me because I thought, well, I've died. I must be in heaven. And somehow this doesn't look like anything I would think that heaven would look like. And so I was puzzled by that. And then Again, a telepathic voice spoke to me from off to my left. And the voice that spoke this time said, follow me. And as I turned in that direction, there was a man who was climbing up a slope out of this area that I had come out into. And as soon as he had said that to me, um, I was right behind him and looking carefully at who, who this person was, or at least what I could see of him. And I, I saw that he had almost black hair, that he had it pulled back and then tied with what looked like a piece of leather. And what he was wearing was like a, like a, a toga type of a garment that was off white and it ended about midway down his thigh above the knee. And again, a tie was around his waist. And um, on his feet, he had sandals. And the sandals weren't just, you know, on his feet. They had ties that crisscrossed and tied below his knees. And I, I felt as though this 
I should know who this person was and that he cared a lot about me, but I couldn't, I could not figure out who it was. And, and I guess I was expecting to see if I was in heaven, I was expecting to see Jesus. And I didn't feel that this person was Jesus, but I didn't really know who he was either. And as we got up over the top of the slope, uh, the, the place turned into a completely different type of a, um, a, not the arid and dry area, but a very lush and green, beautiful place. Uh, and the grass and all sorts of different flowers that were scattered through the grass, everything was as though it was lit from inside and was alive and, and was giving off light. And it was, it was fascinating to see. And I looked ahead and I saw trees, gorgeous trees, and, and they were glowing and giving off light and the leaves were also. And I was mesmerized by this and how the beauty of it all. And the man who had asked me to follow him had gone ahead and he spoke again and said, follow me again. And as he did, I was right behind him as he was on the bank of a river. And the river itself was just alive and glowing and glistening like diamonds and so gorgeous. And on the opposite bank of this river, there were a whole group of people, um, spiritual people, I guess you could say, but I, I am instantly knew that the first one that drew my attention was my father who had died when I was seven. And also with him was my brother who had died in a car accident. And then I realized that the other people that were there were my relatives who had all passed away at different times in my lifetime. And there were aunts and uncles and there were four people that I had never seen or, or recognized, but somehow I just knew that they were my four grandparents who had all died before I was born. And all of them were just so happy and so pleased to see me and just saying, oh, look, she's here. Isn't it wonderful? And I was feeling the same way as though I, I just wanted to be across that water and where they were so badly had missed them so much. And, and the man who I was following, I came to think of as my guide. And he, he telepathically said, no, you can't go there now. You have to follow me. And we have somewhere else you must go first. And so since I wasn't able to direct where my consciousness was moving and was being drawn every place, I was drawn behind him as he went down and around a curve in the river and into a huge opening in the center of which was this enormous building that looked like what you might think of either Greek or Roman, huge, with white columns and lots of stairs up to it and glowing white. It was, I call it pearlescent white because it was that type of a glossy, but giving off light like everything that I had seen while I was there. And my guide had gone all the way up these long stairs to the opening. And he said again, follow me. And as he did, we went inside and this enormous building was inside uh, like a huge in library with uh, tables all down through the center part of it and each side filled with books. And some of the books were not, they were scrolls, they weren't actually books, but uh, there was floor upon floor upon floor as high up as I could see there didn't even seem to be a ceiling. There, it just went on, seemed like endlessly, all these floors on either side filled with books. 
And my guide said, this is the place where the books of life are stored, but we're not staying here. We have another place to go to. So we continued all the way through this entire area and into a small hallway and then into a doorway that went into a much smaller room. And in this much smaller room, there was already a group of, of spiritual beings that were around a huge oval area. If you think of like maybe a conference table in an oval shape, and they were there as though waiting for us to come in. And again, I felt as though I should know who these people are. I should know they care a lot about me and I should I should recognize them, but I didn't. But I did get a feeling as though somehow that they had helped me plan my life before I began living it. And my guide then said, we're going to review your life. And as he said that, it was as though a hologram appeared in the center of this big oval that they were all sitting around. And as it came up into view, I got to view my whole life from the time I was born until then. And it wasn't just a matter of watching it like you'd watch a movie. It, I was actually living it, all of the interactions with all the people all throughout my life. And in addition to feeling everything that I felt at that time that the interaction took place, I was also feeling as though I was the other person at the same time. So if I had been angry and I, I had said mean things to someone, um, then I would be feeling how hurt they felt as well as feeling my own anger at the time or the other way around. If, if I had done something very kind and thoughtful and really didn't give it as much of a second thought, I was feeling how much that other person was appreciating that kindness. And in all these different scenes, I was also able to see the ripple effect of how that carried through that person to the other people they interacted with. And then to the ones that they interacted with, just going out like this enormous effect of just small interactions. And it, it was just the most amazing thing. And where I would feel really badly about, oh, why did I behave like that? Or I could have done better than that. The people, the, the spiritual people who were there with me gave me nothing but support and comfort and feedback of you were learning. This is for you to learn even more about how important it is for everybody when they're interacting with other people. And then I was told, you can stay here if you want, or you can return to your life if you want. But if, if you need to make that choice, we want you to see some of the things that will happen if you decide to go back to your life. Some of them are definite. Others are strong possibility, but because everybody's got free will, the people that you might be going to interact with in your future might choose differently than what we're showing you here. And then the whole thing won't happen exactly as we're showing you. But we want you to be aware of these things before making your decision. And I know that something else happened after I was shown the things about my future, but I have not been allowed to remember what it was. And the next thing I'm aware of is my guide and I are in a much smaller room and it's just the two of us there. And my guide says to me, I want to show you the, the prayers of the people that are praying for you. And so off to my right, I was able to see what looked like musical notes on a score of music, um, whole notes and quarter notes and half notes and yeah, all as though they were attaching one to another, but not across a score of music, but upward, reaching up closer and closer to where we were. Didn't hear any sounds, 
but saw those prayers represented as though they were musical notes. And my guide said, every prayer has its own unique vibration. And then the next thing he said was, I want to show you what's happening in the waiting room in the hospital where your husband and your children are. And so off to my left this time, it was as though I was right above the ceiling of this this waiting room, but that the ceiling was clear and I could see down and into it. And I saw my husband by a doorway um, and he was talking to the doctor who had operated on me, who was in his surgical clothing. Um, and then behind my husband and further back into the room were my two children. And at that point, I could... I was shown that my daughter thought that I had died and that during the surgery and that that's what the surgeon was saying to my husband. And she was nine at the time. And I was shown that she prayed that I not die and that I live and that her prayer ended up being the final link in the musical note prayers. And when that took place, I suddenly was filled with all of my human emotion of being my children's mother, being my husband's wife, being the physical therapist, being everything about me and being filled with the emotion of, oh, I must go back. I can't let my children grow up without their mother like I grew up without my father. And so I, I had made that decision. And at that point, my guide said to me, you won't, you'll be able to remember almost all of what's taken place and you'll have proof that this actually happened. But you won't be able to remember any of the things that we showed you about your future because if you did, then you would, know, you would have lost your free will because you would be responding as though you, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you were shown and so this is what you're supposed to do as opposed to you're actively choosing it yourself. So at that point, I don't remember a return trip to my body. I only remember being in my body and waking up in a recovery room. And in the recovery room, my husband and the children were there beside the stretcher. And I had an immediate full remembrance that I had just had this experience, this amazing divine experience. And I was still filled with the peace and love and joy as though it were not just filling me, but filling a whole area around me, almost like a protective bubble. And I just knew the, the truth of this actually had happened. One of the biggest things for me was just the fact that I had not been judged. Um, I had been a practicing Christian and my feeling was that if I died, as had happened to me, then I would end up being judged for my sins. And I was not judged at all. And I was loved and supported uh, so that did not fit with my entire belief system that I had before I had this experience. And the other thing that didn't fit with my belief system was the, the strong feeling I had that those spiritual people that I met um, had helped me plan my life. And so that said to me, well, how could I plan my life unless I was there on the other side or in heaven before I even was born. And that was nothing that, that fit with my belief system prior either. So there was a lot of, of change and a lot of what I call integrating my experience back into my life and the changes in who I was and how I was so aware of how important it was in every every relationship and every interaction with people, it just kind of changed my personality because I had had a tendency to be judgmental 
because if I, I felt this is right and that is wrong and all of that clear cut feeling that that's how it was just was evaporated by the whole experience being so different than anything that I had ever imagined. And so it changed me as a person and people who knew me as who I was before suddenly are trying to relate to me who I am now. And the same thing with me. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's difficult when your whole perspective of things and your previous belief system is no longer fits. I think the most important thing to, to think of is that you're not going to be, you're not going to be blamed. You're not going to be judged and found lacking um, after you die. You, you're going to be with your loved ones who have already passed on. You're going to be welcomed. You're going to be completely filled with acceptance and love. And that the important thing for the life that we're continuing to live now here before we pass away is to realize just how much it means to be kind and thoughtful to other people. Not because if you if you don't act that way, then you're going to be judged. But because if you do act that way, so much goodness flows out from you and through so many other people as they go on to carry that kindness and love and thoughtfulness on to people they interact with. And it just, just creates an amazingly beautiful experience that can happen here and now. And, and not, not because if you don't do X, Y, and Z, then you won't be able to have a beautiful afterlife. But because if you do do things kindly and thoughtfully, your life that you're living here is going to be so much more beautiful and that it will be for so many other people too. And that that in itself is a, a, a great, great thing. That there is a great awakening, a consciousness, an awareness of our own consciousness and our own divine spark within us that is taking place worldwide at this point. And you did mention Jesus. Um, I believe Jesus um, is a very important individual. I, th I think a lot of what he came to teach um, has, been, has been taught to people, but it's also been reinterpreted by people long after the time that he was here on earth and that a lot of fear has been introduced into his teachings that really were not what he intended. And yet when people do get to encounter Jesus, I personally did not, or at least not during the part that I can remember, that they find that he is a, a completely loving and um, a brother to mankind. Uh, and he often called himself during his ministry, son of man. And so I think he, he felt deeply, deeply connected to us human beings and spiritually still is. I just want to thank everyone who's been listening today uh, for the time that you've taken to, to tune in and to hear my experience and what I have to share with you. If you do have any, any particular thoughts or, or concerns or, or, or ideas that just pop up to you, I don't have a website, I don't have a book or anything like that, but I do have my personal email address, and that is B-L-A-N-C-E-T-H at L-I-V-E dot com. And if you would like to send something to me, 
it's very important that in the subject line, you put saw your near death experience interview. That way I will know that it's someone who saw this and, and just would like to interact a little more. And thank you again, everyone.